Lena Anchu. So she was a former student in many engineer school in France. She earned uh, a master from uh, Ecole Polytechnique and a PhD from Telecom Paris. During her uh, PhD, she studied different uh, statistical attacks on symmetric ciphers. And she was one on the, of the four founders of Gem Plus security and cryptographic team during the 90s. Then she moved to the US and worked for cryptographic research and she became director of the IECR. And um, now she's a security technology fellow at Rhombus and she is responsible for many different research activities including crypto and post-quantum crypto, uh, power analysis, side channel and countermeasure, and um, security architecture for new products and services. So she was recently appointed um, chairwoman for the Risk 5 Foundation Security Standing Committee and she will present the work in this committee in this invited talk. So please join me to thank Elena. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I hope the mic is on, it works. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> Uh, all right, so indeed, my name is Helena Hanshu and uh, I'm a Rambus Security Technologies Fellow. Uh, I'm also the RISC V uh, Security Standing Committee Chair and uh, it's, it's my pleasure to chair that committee because it is security related and that's one of the topics that we like to work on at Rambus and that this community likes to work on as well. So let me try to give you a little bit of an overview um, of what RISC V, the foundation does and how that relates to security and what the security committee is trying to do as well. Um, okay, does that work? Yes, perfect. So here's a little bit of the outline of my talk. Let me just start the, hang on just a sec, so I know how much time I have. Okay. Um, first I'll try to say a few words about the RISC V Foundation itself, when it was created and how uh, it started working, what, what the current status is of the specs and stuff. And then I will talk about the Security Standing Committee creation and its charger and uh, the task groups that we currently have that work on security. Uh, I'll say a few words about some DARPA activities that some of us in the foundation have, which is not directly related under the umbrella of the foundation, but still related to the same topic. Uh, I'll talk about the speaker program we have, um, mention some academic and industry initiatives <coughs> around Risk V, and then maybe some open problems and research directions that you might be interested in hearing about, that you might get interested in working on, and hopefully you would then join us and, and to uh, uh, bring the work to the foundation as well. Okay. All right, so first things first, uh, Risk V, pronounced Risk V. Um, is a free and open instruction set architecture enabling a new era of processor innovation through open standard collaboration. That's the official line of the RISC-V Foundation. Uh, it was founded in 2015, so four, about four years ago. Uh, in the meantime, it already has more than 300 members. Uh, this includes both organizations and individual members. Uh, as an individual, you can also join the foundation and have access to the specs and work on, on, on everything if you'd like to. It's open, it's a collaborative community of software and hardware innovators, so both sides are being looked at. Um, the base ISA itself was born in academia uh, and in research. It was put together by Berkeley uh, and then given into the foundation. It's a new level of free, extensible software and hardware freedom on architecture. Uh, we hope to be paving the way for the next 50 years of computing design and innovation. And as I said, members of the foundation can have access to and participate in the development of the specs, of the extensions, um, and all the related hardware and software developments and ecosystem. And recently, somebody told me, you know, when you make slides like this, which are full of words and you have to read all of that, nobody really understands anything. So you should highlight what you want to say. Okay, so let's go. There we go. It's free, open, open, free, 
lots of freedom, and the website is here. Okay, so that's risk five. Um, let me give you a few words of intro on what the uh, basis for uh, the work is here. So the first thing that was worked on was the risk five instruction set manual. Uh, it has uh, two volumes. The first one is volume one called the user level ISA. It was mainly edited by Andrew Waterman and Krister Azanovic, and the version, uh, the most recent version that was, well, the first version that was brought into the foundation was version 2.1, 2.2, uh, in May of 2017. It was drafted in May of 2017. It's a Creative Commons Attribution International License, so you can use it, it's open, it's free. Um, and it was originally derived from uh, a version 2.1, which was uh, written by Andrew Jungsup, David Patterson, and Krister Azanovic. Okay, so what does it actually contain and do? Well, there is first of all a base instruction set architecture. So uh, it has different sizes, uh, register sizes. Um, you can work on a 32-bit version, you can work with a 32-bit embedded version, which has a, a slightly reduced uh, version of the instruction set, 64-bit and 128-bit. And then on top of that, we have so-called extensions. Uh, so there's a, a number of different such extensions that are being worked on. One of them is called, they, they go by letters. Uh, so one of them is called the M extension, which is for multiplication and division. Uh, another one is called A for atomic instructions. Uh, then you have a few different ones on floating point uh, operations, so single precision, double precision, quadruple precision, and decimal. You have a compressed instruction uh, set extension. You have bit manipulation extensions, and you have, there's a bunch more. Uh, one of them is important for us specifically for cryptography. Uh, one of them is called vector extensions. All right, so this is the first version that was uh, contributed. Uh, now what happened next, uh, move forward, uh, fast forward a little bit from that first version, is that uh, two, about two months ago in June, on June 8, uh, this first volume one user level ISA was ratified by the foundation, so it's now a stable, ratified, adopted specification that everybody can use, uh, and it's officially uh, um, promoted by the foundation. So the difference between the ratified one and the previous one. Let me show you what it is. First of all, there's a little bit more work that went into it in the last two years. Uh, most notably, it went from 145 to 236 pages, so a lot of more stuff. Uh, it does show the ratified parts, and it has additional extensions. So this is a little bit small. You might not be able to read it completely, uh, but you can, if you look at the spec on the website, you can see the ratified portions. Some of the extensions have already been ratified. The others are still being worked on. Uh, so they are called drafts. Um, one of them, the one that we're interested in, the V extension, you can see is still a draft. So that makes Rich over here very happy because every time he wants to build on it, he has to go back and look at what they changed last week. Um, but it's you know progressing in parallel. We're working. Uh, at the same time, and so we're trying to get these things towards ratification as we go. Okay. Um, then there's a second thing uh, that has been ratified at the same time as the base level ISA, which is the volume number two, uh, which is about privileged architecture. So the first one is the user level interface, but below that you have levels of privileges that certain, you know, where you have certain permissions and certain rights that get executed at that, those levels. And this is what the second volume talks about, uh, which was ratified at the same time. It was edited by the same people, has the same uh, license attached to it, all that's the same. And what it does show um, is the following. <coughs> Sorry. It does define three different modes in addition to the user mode. It defines the machine mode, which is the lowest level, which is very close to the hardware, usually implemented in hardware. The supervisor mode, which can be done in hardware as well, but you could start being able to go into software a bit more. That depends how your architecture looks like. 
um, the hypervisor mode, and then finally the user mode, which is in the previous volume. Uh, so far, we have two modes that have been ratified in June. This is the machine and the supervisor mode. Um, and the third one, the hypervisor one, is still in draft. So you can still contribute and make comments and provide feedback. And if you join the foundation, you can work on getting that towards ratified as well. All right, so three modes here plus one user mode. This is what we have so far in the foundation uh, as the base for everybody to work on. All right, so I usually get the question, but okay, this is great, this is paperwork. Uh, do you guys have anything for real? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> so uh, on the website, if you go on the Risk Five Foundation's website, you will see a list of 65 cores that people have been working on. And I'm sure there's more out there. If not all of them are listed here, then please let us know if you're working on this as well. Uh, give us more references so we can list them and uh, give people <coughs> pointers to your work. But here you will see 65 cores uh, that are already available. Uh, many different companies are working on them. There's cores by uh, companies such as Andes and Sci5 makes them available uh, uh, for you to use. And uh, Microchip has some. There's, there's plenty of different uh, uh, companies. And there's also universities. ETH Zurich, for example, has a few of them that they built, uh, MIT worked on them, Berkeley worked on them, so plenty of things to play around with. Um, <coughs> one little side note here, um, none of these have passed the Risk Five compliance suite yet, and this is for a very simple reason, because this compliance suite is still in development, so it's a little bit difficult to have already passed something that's not completely finished. We're working things in parallel as soon as uh, the compliance suits and, and uh, formal specs have been finished and ratified and everything, then we will start being able to have the cores pass those suites as well. All right, so a bunch of cores available. The other thing that is uh, useful as well, useful to know, is that you have uh, a, a number of tools and software associated to Risk V. Uh, available that uh, is listed on the RISC-V website as well. So for example, if you look for simulators or uh, debugging tools, uh, compilers, bootloaders, OS and OS kernels, compilers, you name it, all of that, you can go on the website, click on the link and see what, what other people are working on, what they've put on their own websites, and you can, some of it, some of it is open and free, some of it is more commercial, but you will always find something that's useful to you uh, to be able to work on. And very um, new uh, to this environment, we also have a link now on that website for security software. Uh, there's not a whole lot yet there, uh, but I've listed here in the little square the two things that have been posted there since the last month or so. Uh, so one company called Hex5 is working on an SDK there, and I'll come back to that on what they do. Uh, and the Keystone project has uh, posted their uh, Keystone Enclave there. So you can, you can go and, and look at that as well. All right. OK, so this is globally what the foundation does, everything that you have access to that you can look up. Now let's get to the real topic, which is Risk V. How about security? What about security? So let me go back in time a little bit and talk to you about January 2018. January 2018, Spectre and Meltdown. That was the oops moment. So suddenly, uh, people working on processors realize there's something there that shouldn't be there. Namely, if you look at speculative execution, branch prediction, and all these things, you suddenly realize that you're leaking information through, for example, cache timing side channels, because you're trying to speculate about something that will happen in the future, you start um, looking at data that you're not supposed to be looking at because you haven't computed the previous result yet, yet you're already looking at something that you shouldn't be looking at. And so by this little magic, suddenly data gets exposed that nobody should have seen. And so this was a big realization for the foundation saying, oh wait, we are working on open free processors 
And there's this thing going on whereby other processes are being greatly hacked and broken by these side channel attacks, new form of side channel attacks. What should we be doing about this? We need to do something about it. All right, so this was exactly uh, what led to the creation of the Security Standing Committee, which I have the pleasure of chairing. Uh, so this happened around July timeframe, and by the, the time we got our, uh, our uh, uh, publications together and, and knew what we wanted to work on, it was about July, and that's when the uh, Security Standing Committee was announced. Uh, so July 2nd, uh, press release, Risk V Foundation announces Security Standing Committee creation, calling for participation. Uh, so I had said back then, apparently, that security is one of the fundamental issues in our connected world, still true, and that we would like to address existing and emerging threats. And Joe Kinnery, which I will come back to as well, um, was uh, talking about the advent of a new compute platform that has formal methods at its foundation for processor correctness and security. So it's all, all about proving and formally assuring security uh, during hardware development. How do you make sure that you can formally say, my design has these properties and prove it? Okay, so this uh, standing committee has been uh, created about a year ago and has been working on different things since then. Let me show you what the mandate of that uh, committee is when it got created. So this is, compared to other committees in the foundation, this is a permanent committee. Uh, the non-permanent ones are called task groups, and I'll give you two examples of what we're working on. Uh, but this one is a permanent one. So the permanent one looks at things that are going on in the security world, what should we be working on. Uh, it can recommend, for example, to create task groups which then go and write specifications, specific specification drafts that then work, um, go towards ratification. It is meant as uh, an ideal vehicle for the security committee, uh, community, so this community here. It liaises with other committees inside the foundation but also outside the foundation. So for example, uh, we're starting discussions with Global Platform as one of them. Uh, we might be talking later on to TCG and to FIDO and other uh, committees like that to see where we intersect and how we should be working together. Um, we have a mandate to create an information repository, new attack trends, countermeasures, and stuff that's going on in the world of security that is important to the foundation and that people should know about. Uh, we're identifying top 10 challenges in security for the RISC-V community, and I guess very up, top, top up there is all about side channel attacks, the new version of it, I would say. Um, we do propose task groups, as I mentioned. We are here to recruit security talent, so if you're interested, please join us, work with us. It's a lot of fun. It's challenging, not easy at all, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and develop consensus around best practices uh, for maybe even the smaller devices like IoT and embedded systems. Okay, so mentioning task groups, we already have created two task groups that deal specifically with security. One of them, the first one, is the Cryptographic Extensions Task Group. Uh, this one is chaired by Richard Newell from Microchip, sitting right here. So if you have any questions, please ask him. Uh, the vice chair that has uh, recently been nominated and approved is Derek Atkins from SecureRF. Uh, and these um, Two great folks are trying to get us some crypto extensions on top of the vector extensions. So the charter that is proposed in this task group is to build extensions on top of vector extensions that would be useful for cryptographic algorithms. Uh, the intent is to have a base and an extended version of that. The base one would have low cost instructions uh, for acceleration of the most the traditional and common algorithms, and the more evolved one would have even greater functionality. There would also be reserved encodings for other types of algorithms, all sorts of types of algorithms, uh, because there's a bunch out there, um, so that we can get better security performance out of it. Um, it includes both symmetric and asymmetric algorithms uh, in its mandate, as well as uh, other primitives, related primitives, such as hash functions, message, digests, 
and the committee will also at some point be looking at random numbers uh, and secure key management. Um, now remember that the foundation works at the instruction set level. So these kinds of committees do not define how you actually do, for example, generate random numbers, but it defines how you build your random number generator into the system, how you have access to it uh, through the instruction set. Is that right, Rich? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so remember that you stay at that level and don't necessarily look at how it's being implemented at the, at the hardware side. Okay, so a little bit of um, uh, status update on where this, uh, this uh, task group is at. Uh, right now, it is working on AES instructions for three uh, key sizes, and that's done. Uh, the SHA-2 instructions are being looked at for both 256 and 512, uh, which is almost done, pretty close. Um, for both of them, there is one solution that lets you do a one round approach and a full round approach for AES, and the SHA one is a 16 and a full round approach. Uh, so these are the, the solutions are being worked on and are pretty much done. Now we're in the step of needing to convert that into official specs. So we know how we want to do it. Now we have to draft the specs and then get the specs ratified at some point. Uh, the group has also been looking at prototyping public key algorithms on top of the base instruction set, so looking at how to do long integer arithmetic, and there is an implement implementation proof of concept that we've looked at, so just to make sure we can do it, and it's, it's available, uh, to, and it works. Uh, and some future directions here are the more lightweight approach, maybe, to this entire thing. Uh, remember that this is based on vector extensions, which is quite a broad set of extensions. So one possibility would be to look at maybe just a subset of the vector extensions to make it lighter, or to completely move, remove the vector extension dependability and just include some smaller uh, uh, instructions for that instead. So there's an approach that was proposed very recently by the University of Bristol uh, called Xcrypto which proposes scalar instructions, rotates like smaller style instructions to have the software, uh, the crypto software run faster. And Bristol has recently joined the foundation is now part of the discussions to see how we could um, do all of that together. <coughs> Sorry. And I'm hearing that uh, Telecom Paris Tech also interest, expressed some interest in this kind of research. If you're working on things like that, if you wanna talk to us, Talk to Rich, please do so. Join the foundation and come work with us. Uh, all new ideas are really welcome. All right. Um, the second one, second task group we have currently is one uh, that is looking at how to build a trusted execution environment on top of uh, the RISC-V architecture. This one is led by Joe Shi from NVIDIA and Nick Kosifidis from Ford. Um, and what they're trying to do is really define an architecture spec that will support trusted execution uh, on top of RISC-V processors. Uh, so they are looking at providing implementation guidelines, recommendations, um, and to develop kind of the components that you will need to, to have an, a TE available, such as compilers, simulation models, hardware, software components, uh, because you built up, it's a bigger system than just the processor. What do you need for that? What is mandatory for that? What is you know, necessary, sufficient, and so on? So in terms of where they are at, currently what they're looking at is that the first thing is um, a PMP model that they defined, uh, physical memory protection. It is based on the privilege spec on the latest version 1.12. Um, they're also looking, same thing, how to, you know, securely divide up the memory and how to protect it securely uh, at the outer limits. So th that's called the IOPMP. It's at a proposal stage zero, version 0 0.1. And as a next step on the hardware side, they will be looking at control flow integrity extensions. What can be done there? On the software side, uh, the work that's being done is a security monitor, secure monitor architecture. Uh, there's a document being put together on secure, secure boot architecture, so you, you recognize all the traditional notions that you have around uh, trusted execution. Uh, we're trying to, trying to architect and formalize that. So the first secure boot architecture has signature verification as, its, as a basis, and then some op optional extensions for further on for key management, certs, 
revocation and attestation and things like that. <coughs> and the other part that's being worked on and looked at is the TE APIs. So an API to the other parts of the system, for example, between trusted applications and the OS, between two trusted applications, how do they talk to each other? Um, how do you attest uh, a trusted application? How do you uh, talk between a trusted application and a security monitor, et cetera? So all of these APIs are being looked at and discussed and debated and hopefully drafted and standardized at some point. <coughs> Oops, sorry, everybody awake now? Okay, so on a slightly different note and subject, uh, there is another activity going on which is not directly under the umbrella of the Risk V Foundation, but very uh, deeply related to it. This is driven by Joe Kinnery from Galois. He is also the uh, vice chair of the Security Standing Committee. Uh, and he's involved in a lot of different DARPA projects, one of them being the SIF project, and I forgot what the acronym mean, means, but S is probably security, and then the other S and H are software and hardware. Um, so there's, they're looking at how can you build secure systems, how can you kind of model secure systems with security properties, and how can you reason about them, how can you formalize that, and then prove that your system is secure. Uh, one of the things they look at is a formal spec language for hardware design uh, called Lando. And this one has four sub-languages, a system spec language, an architecture language, a product line engineering language, and a security property language. So you can specify what your security properties should be, what they should look like, and then you can reason about it and you can verify. That's the work that they're doing. So not all of this is public, not all of this will be public in the future, uh, but as DARPA allows to publish allows Galois to publish some of this, it will become available and they will contribute it into the RISC-V Foundation as well. They're also working on a domain model uh, for specifying security properties. Uh, so for example, they've started by formalizing the NIST CWEs and among those mostly the ones relating to buffer and memory errors. So this is all going in the direction of formalizing vulnerabilities and checking that they're not there in your design. And again, as these things get in, um, become publishable, publishable and DARPA allows to publish more of it, these will get contributed into the foundation and everybody will uh, be able to look at it and use it. Along the same lines, uh, they're working on a tool suite that's called Bespin for formal reasoning. Um, <coughs> and a subsystem of that tool suite has already been published and made available to uh, the RISC-V formal group. Uh, this part is called BRIFT, uh, and it stands for something like Galois RISC-V formal tool or something like that, close. Uh, but it's a part of this larger system, tooling system called BESPIN, where you can uh, use the tool to formally prove things. Uh, and finally, uh, they work on many different things, but the ones that are interesting for the RISC-V foundation uh, are the ones around platform specs and security-enriched ISAs. So what they've done recently, I believe it was at DEF CON this month, uh, they have started showing a secure voting machine platform spec, uh, which has certain security guarantees in it. Uh, so it's meant to be open uh, for public review. It's meant to be offered as a, as a, as a game to uh, go against and to try to attack. It's a voting machine, so everybody knows that the state of voting, secure voting machines is an interesting state these days. So um, this is an attempt at trying to make a secure one. If you can go and try to hack it, if you find interesting results, please feed that back to them. Uh, we will incorporate that, they will do that, and then incorporate into the platform specs as they go and build better systems. It's a bit of a, a, a hackers and builders game. Uh, they're also working on six other platform specs based on RISC V SOCs. Uh, the, the six that they're looking at are Rocket, Boom, Piccolo, Flute, Bassoon, and Risky. If you've never heard about this, go on the website and uh, look at them. These are the ones that are mostly being worked on by MIT, Berkeley, ETH, Zurich, I believe, and then there's two, the two others, I, I don't remember which 
um, which institution proposed them, but they're like very open. You can look at how that works. Uh, and later on, hopefully, we will see some of the platform specs being published as well, uh, as DARPA gives authorization to do that. Okay, so this is the kind of more formalization uh, security proof approach in hardware design that um, this part uh, of, of Bellway is going, uh, is working on. Okay, so we also have a speaker program in the Security Standing Committee. We have so far invited uh, a number of people uh, as, as we went. Uh, remember, we have about uh, one speaker per month average, I would say. Um, we alternate between um, a business meeting and a speaker program uh, in the, in the uh, committee meetings. Uh, so this means that every other time we have a guest and every other time we talk about, okay, so what's, what's new in the world? What should we be looking at? Is there a new task group we should be creating? What should we be doing? Uh, okay, so the speakers we've had so far, uh, Gernot Heiser from Data61 on timing attacks and an augmented form of the instruction set. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. We had uh, Dayal Lee from Berkeley on the Keystone project. Jose Renault Esperanto on timing attack mitigation ideas. You can see that most of the topics are around how do we get rid of these annoying side channel attacks. Uh, John Geiger was talking about um, TEs uh, and what these things uh, look like. Uh, Nicole Fern from uh, Tortuga Logic has been presenting on security oriented verification tools. It's kind of a tool that allows you to check at the hardware level whether some of the security uh, vulnerabilities that you would like to avoid are really not there. Uh, Daniel Genking has been talking to us about foreshadow. Stefan Mangat and his team uh, have been talking to us about uh, specific security ISA extensions. I'll say just a couple more words about that later. Uh, and Ben Marshall, I already mentioned him from the University of Bristol, um, has been talking to us about his X crypto extensions to the uh, uh, ISA so that faster crypto can be built. If you would like to talk, give a talk on RISC V security topics, your name goes here, please come talk to us. Uh, we can set up a time for you to talk to the group uh, and then we can talk about the topic that you'd like to present. So we're trying to collect all the information about people, uh, institutions, academics, organizations that are working on RISC V and security so that there's kind of a little bit of a centralized um, uh, information repository about all these initiatives. Okay. Um, a few other ongoing security initiatives. Uh, there was, independent from the Risk V Foundation, again, there was a security contest, but it is related to Risk V, so I wanted to mention it. There was a hackathon at DAC last year uh, where uh, a group of, of people have organized kind of a hardware bug hunting. And because Risk V specs and everything are open, they chose it as a platform that was easy to implement fake bugs into, if you want, and then give them to everybody to go after, try to see if they could find them. Uh, so they had a systematic bug construction approach for bug hunting. Uh, and along the way, apparently, they also found a couple of native bugs in some of the Risk V processors. So open and available to everybody does not necessarily equate security. It helps a lot. It's a good starting point, but there can still be issues and bugs can be found. So this is something that we should also keep in mind. And you can, you can go online and check it out and ask them what, what kind of uh, bugs they put in there for people to hunt after. Another ongoing security initiative, uh, still in the same area, security contest. This is all new. And uh, again, if you're interested, please talk to Rich. Uh, it's being run by Talis and Microchip. It was announced on July 15th. It's a sort of hackathon. Uh, they're looking for open source submissions on uh, a Microchip FPGA, where you, have, um, where you propose a, a construction with security countermeasures. It's based on Zephyr where you're allowed to make a limited uh, number of changes to the compiler. 
Um, and the deadline for submissions is September 15, so hurry up. <laughs> uh, and the idea is to try to come up with a security implementation uh, and a security proposal that will protect at least against uh, the five classical, very classical attacks which are listed here. So it's about corrupting function pointers, buffer overflows on the stack, uh, corrupting function pointers both on the heap and the stack, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so if you have a proposal, uh, please submit it to the contest. Uh, it's supposed to run on the microchip FPGA, and Talus, I believe, is the one that will be assessing security on it. Uh, a few more initiatives. Uh, on the academic and national lab side of uh, the world, we have mentioned already, but I'll mention them again. Uh, the uh, University of Graz is working on uh, extensions for security, uh, mainly around trying to uh, counteract side channel attacks, uh, control flow integrity, uh, and trying to um, work on secure memory access. So they built extensions for that, and I believe all that work is, is pretty much public. So you could either talk to Stefan and his team, which is sitting somewhere in the audience as well, uh, or you can look up their papers that they've published already. The University of Bristol, which I mentioned, X Crypto Extensions, and uh, Telecom Paris Tech also expressed interest. I don't know that they have published papers yet, or if they have, please send them to me so I can list them here, uh, but there's interest there as well. Um, another um, initiative that was presented at the workshop uh, in Zurich this year, uh, earlier this year in June, was from CEO Aleti. They're working on a secure processor with es essentially everything authenticated and encrypted in there. So all of the resources are uh, essentially secured, functionally secured. Buses, bus access, uh, buses, memory accesses, data path, instruction path, everything is nicely authenticated and encrypted. Uh, the slides are online at the Zurich workshop. You can go online and see, see it there. Uh, they, I believe, also published a paper on it. Um, they will be giving a talk, hopefully, to us later this year, but uh, not quite ready yet. Um, but, okay, it is not super fast, obviously, if you encrypt and authenticate all of these lines, but it allows for a very secure implementation of a processor if you have applications for that. <clears throat> a couple more initiatives around secure enclaves uh, based on Risk V. Um, one of them is called Sanctum from MIT, and that is a basis for the a Keystone project from Berkeley as well. They're slightly related. Uh, there is uh, another initiative called Open Titan from Google, with five base as well. There is, uh, remember at the beginning I had a slide on security software stuff and Hex5 was mentioned there. So what they do, what they propose is a multi-zone TE API and that one's available for you to look at and review. So they propose a way of having multiple different secure applications run at the same time, uh, or at least on the same platform, such that they can kind of attack each other. Uh, we do have a few initiatives as well, so uh, if you want to hear about our crypto manager root of trust, you can have a look at the demo next door over coffee or lunch. And Joel Wittenauer, who might be still sitting here in the audience today, he says no, or he says yes. <laughs> he says yes. Uh, Joel is sitting here, he gave an invited talk yesterday at FBTC, he can tell you all about how to run mutually distrusting applications on a RISC-V uh, embedded platform such that they can essentially attack each other. We also have an initi initiative going on, it's not a secure enclave, it's just the processor here, but an initi initiative going on uh, which is DPA resistant, a DPA resistant RISC-V CPU. Uh, by Mike Hutter, Elke de Mulder, and Samata uh, Gumala, and this has been published and talked about before at the RISC-V Summit last year, as well as uh, an invited talk at DAC this year, earlier this year, and next month there's a Lawrence workshop where uh, Mike Hutter is probably going to say a little bit more about that as well. Some of them are in the audience as well, so you can talk to them about that. Okay. All right, so these are kind of the initiatives that I wanted to talk about a little bit on what exists today, everything the foundation does, all the task groups, uh, the things that are 
either commercially or openly available that you can play with, software, ecosystem, and all of that. Now let me, in the last few minutes of this talk, uh, maybe talk a little bit more about what still needs to be done. Uh, remember that a foundation is a, like a standardization organization, and so it does advance at a certain speed. It doesn't go super fast, but it does steadily advance. Uh, so if you want to contribute, please come and help us. And these are maybe some of the topics that we still need to work on. Okay, first one, big question is how to mitigate microarchitectural flaws. So what we found out over the past year and a half is that um, beyond the original you know, side channel attacks we talked about 20 years ago, which was GPA and, and EMA and all of that, differential fault attacks, <clears throat> there is another complete set of side channel attacks, some of them yet to be found, uh, that will, is going to hit you know, processor manufacturers and developers as we move forward, because there's so many things still to, to be found. So the question is, how do we really try to um, counteract these? Because most of these happen at the microarchitectural level. The foundation is working at the instruction set level. How do we make sure that we can specify something, help people understand how to build, build better systems without necessarily completely specifying what works at the, uh, what is done at the microarch level. So that's one of the big questions that we're trying to tackle. Um, we've started discussing that we couldn't necessarily do it at the ISA level, but we could de describe platform specs, which go a bit further, and would give you some indication and some hints of how to add special instructions that would help mitigate some of these things. So that's kind of the direction we're trying to go. Uh, so how do we do better than proprietary microarch? How do we publish more, explain more, uh, yet leave the actual implementation uh, free for the uh, uh, implementer and the organization to do whatever they want? So we specify one level, and the what comes below is open to anybody to do what, what they want. Big question. Some ideas on how to mitigate these have been proposed um, by people that uh, have written papers about it and have published about it. So here I'm listing a few uh, ideas and directions that have been proposed. Now we're trying to look at how do we build these ideas into a platform spec. How does that work? So Gernot, I mentioned him before, has looked at something called the augmented ISA. Um, he proposes a way of adding uh, cache flush instructions into a system, uh, as well of, as trying to partition the memory in ways that uh, different processes cannot access each other's uh, private information. So it's a little bit difficult to build, but that's one of the directions we're trying to go. Uh, José Renaud from Esperanto also had some timing attack mitigation ideas in there. He was going down a bit more the path of kind of adding tags with security classifications to your uh, to your elements so that you could kind of give some security property to each of them and follow the properties through the, through the, uh, through the flow. And recently at the Secure Enclaves workshop in Berkeley last month, was actually, sorry, it was this month, um, Chris Fletcher from the University of Illinois proposed something called speculative taint tracking. So which is again some idea of tainting registers uh, and defining corresponding update policies, such as if one register is tainted and you mix it with one that's not, then both of them are tainted, so you kind of have to follow the flow through your design, make sure that your specific information that you want to keep private, confidential, or authenticated will have the same properties as you go through the, through the, through the process. So these are some, some examples of works that are being done, and we're trying to figure out how to add this into our, our main specs. Okay. Another one, another big question that we're trying to deal with, and that comes up uh, more and more, is what about security certification? So should the RISC V Foundation actually be involved in it? And if so, how? The question comes up because being at the instruction set level, we don't look necessarily at how the implementation is done. That's not the mandate of what we do. So how do you make sure that you can certify for security if you're not looking at how the implementation was done and how it leaks or not? That's a good question. 
So we've had, um, <clears throat> the first thing that we're doing is that we're creating formal specs and compliance test suites, but this is only, I would say, a functional um, spec compliance aspect of it. So it has a certain function and that function will be realized functionality will be realized, that doesn't tell you anything about how much it leaks or not. So how do you certify, given that the micro arc specs are kind of out of scope and that every flaw we've seen more recently is related to that side of things? Good question. So we started some discussions with different evaluation labs, security labs that are, or other organizations that are proposing different schemes and we are trying to see if there could be certain security levels that we could define that would maybe not necessarily look at the exact implementation, but at least from a functional perspective, prove that the security properties are done right at least. Uh, so the two that have been proposed so far are CESIP and PSA for more IoT-oriented devices. One of them, interestingly enough, is driven by ARM, but uh, my understanding is that you can perfectly submit a RISC-V based design to this, uh, uh, to this scheme as well. So discussions about how do we do this? How do we even approach this? Any good ideas, please talk to me. Uh, so this brings up an interesting question as well, a question that I got at one of the recent uh, workshops about, well, how do you position open source versus security certification, because if some of you, most of you, is, uh, I'm assuming are uh, familiar with common criteria and how that security game works. And there's something in there called the Jill tables in which you get points uh, if your design uh, is actually not accessible and is hard to find. So essentially, your design is more secure in some sense if you don't make specs available and it is hard to discover what's in your product. So if we're talking open source, this is going the exact opposite direction. You benefit from everybody being able to look at your design, making comments, you find bugs, and you can improve, but you lose points on the, uh, on the Jill tables and the common criteria game. How does that fit together? That's a question I got recently, and I don't know that I have a good answer to that yet. So open source was just some form of, I'm calling it obscurity, which is a little bit uh, over the top probably here. But it is a form of obscurity to say you get more points if your design is harder to find because nobody has seen it before and never will. Good question. All right, and then the other direction is assurance. So I've talked about that a little bit before. Uh, formal verification, hardware security properties and guarantees towards that. I've mentioned a few tools that Galois is working on, Lando, or Specs and Tools, uh, Lando, Bespin, and Grift. Uh, there's other things going on in this world on uh, security assurance in that form. I've listed a few things here which are not just RISC-V related. They're broader than that, uh, but please see some of these companies are here. Uh, at chess this week as well. They have interesting things to propose. For example, um, Riskure has a kind of software source code analysis uh, a tool that's called True Code. Secure IC has something a little bit similar, uh, but I believe at the hardware level called Virtualizer. Um, Fortify IQ has a, a tool called Trace IQ, which is trying to see if some of your designs are a resistant you know, to power, power analysis or not. Uh, and Tortuga Logic is a company that proposes a tool called Radix that can go, that can analyze your RTL and see if certain security vulnerabilities are uh, present or absent and helps you design better at the RTL level. I'm sure there's plenty more stuff going on. This is kind of the things that I'm mostly aware of. If you're working on something else that I haven't talked about, haven't listed, uh, please speak up and uh, we'll be happy to, to include information about what you do here. All right, a uh, couple more minutes. Uh, one or two more ideas that you could be looking at or working on. What about RISC-V and post-quantum crypto? We're going the first step, we're a little behind, so to speak, looking at algorithms that were, you know, done 10, 5, 10 years ago. We're doing that now. But what about the future? What about post-quantum stuff that's coming up? And there were interesting presentations about it this morning. 
uh, how do we address it as the Risk V Foundation level? Should, be, should we be looking at addressing it at the vector extension level? Does that even make sense? Should we specify completely new stuff like inner products that would make some of the constructions go faster? Uh, is this necessary? Is this sufficient? Is it even going to be useful? Will it gain performance? Should we do it? Should we not? If you want to work on this and propose a group, please do. Should we be doing any specific extensions for lattices, codes, uh, super singular isogenies? How do we do that with the current instructions and what else do we need? Another uh, open research question. Okay. Uh, almost done here. So I think I've given you a little bit of an overview of everything the foundation does. Uh, the tools that are available, specs that are available, work that the task groups are doing right now, um, future work that we could be looking at, and most importantly, the open problems is how to really deal with security when security is done at the implementation level. How do we do that? Any ideas are welcome. We have some ideas and we'll be coming up with interesting platform specs, but everything relating to implementation level leakage, uh, we need to think about how to address that. So open source, I would say in general, is a great approach, even if you lose a couple of points on the Jill table. Uh, there's many new opportunities. There's a lot of stuff happening. There's a thriving risk five ecosystem. Uh, please do look at the open problems. Please continue working on everything and let us know of your results. Uh, there's many good ideas already, a uh, lot of initiatives, but still many things to be done. So this is really a call to action. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of CHESS for inviting me today to be able to give this talk to you. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, we can either take them now or over lunch probably because I'm standing between you and lunch now. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And I hope to have good discussions going forward. Thank you. So yes, we do not have too much time for questions, but if you have uh, one or two. I have one. What's for lunch? <laughs> what? what is for lunch? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if there is no question, we can go to lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Elena. Oh, sorry, we missed also two presentations for the first session of the uh, afternoon. So if there is some speaker, come to join us. <laughs>